Hello, today is November the 4th, 2020. And if you're here for how MasterCard turned its documentation into a superior customer experience with Jill Sheffield, you're in the right place. My name is Scott Abel, and I'll be your host for today's show. Let me tell you a few things about this webinar. First of all, we cannot see or hear you, so you don't have to worry about your camera or microphone. Um, we also can't have a two-way conversation with you, but let me tell you something more useful, which is what you can do during the show. You can actually ask us a question by uh, tapping the Ask the Questions tab in your webinar viewing panel. At the end of the presentation, the presenter and, and, uh, and myself and the co-host will, will answer as many questions as we have time for. Also, you can get help at any time by accessing the attachment section of your webinar viewing panel and click, clicking on the Help link. Uh, it'll give you some troubleshooting advice if you need that. Also, there's additional content in the attachments and links section provided by the organizer and the uh, sponsor of today's show. So definitely check that out. You can usually get a copy of the slides and any handouts that are available from the presentation. At the end of the show, I'll ask you to interact with us one last time by giving us five, uh, one through five star rating. Five is a high rating. There's also a little field that allows you to provide an uh, indicator to the presenter of what you thought about their presentation and why you gave them a, uh, the rating that you did. We appreciate that feedback, and I know that the uh, presenter will as well, so I'll definitely encourage you at the end of the show to do that. Uh, one last thing, I need to uh, welcome our co-host today, Megan Gahilde. Megan, how are you, and are you on the line? I'm on the line. I'm here. Great. Thanks, Scott. Excellent. I, uh, do you want me to go ahead? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. I'm Megan Gilhuli. I am Vice President of Customer Experience here at Zoomin, and we're very excited to, to be here today. I do want to tell you really quickly what Zoomin does. So Zoomin makes it easy for customers to find the answers they need. And we do this by ingesting technical product content from multiple sources and delivering it all with a unified experience across various places including a doc portal, your community, your customer service site, or even in your product itself. So in this way, we really help customers self-serve, and we help your organization reduce support costs and improve product adoption. So with that, I want to introduce our wonderful guest today, and that is Jill Sheffield. Jill Sheffield is the VP of Content Strategy and Development at MasterCard. And so, Jill, I'm going to do my best at, at introducing you, and you can add in anything I miss, but I think I, I, I have quite a bit here. So you've been at MasterCard for almost 13 years, and I do know that you worked in network operations up until the time you jumped into content, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you worked in Warsaw, Poland for a while, which is super interesting. And uh, I think some of the more personal interesting things from you are that you're a Floridian that's living in the Midwest, which you know must be tough on snow days. And also that you have something in, in common with my daughter, which is that you both go by the nickname of Sassy, which I think is super cool. <laughs> How'd I do? You did great, Megan. That's, that's absolutely fabulous. Did I miss anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. All right. Well, we'll get going then. Thanks so much for joining us. This is going to be fun. Um, yeah, so I'm excited. In the past 18 months, I know you and MasterCard in general have been on a bit of a journey to transform this content team that you're leading. And so in this presentation, we're going to talk about how your team transformed its content strategy to deliver targeted content to a global audience, really to, to elevate the customer experience, but also to improve efficiency and content development and management. We'll also talk about the methods you use, the technologies, the processes that you use to boost your voice of customer score. And then lastly, we'll talk about how MasterCard envisions the future of personalized content delivery how you'll be using AI and ML to support that, and how you plan to measure the impact on customer satisfaction, retention, productivity, things like that. Does that all sound right? That sounds fabulous. Good. All right, so let's jump in. I want to start by hearing about your personal journey. So you came into the content world fairly recently. So can you just tell us about that, that journey? 
Sure. Um, that journey started, you know, when I was asked to leave this team. And as you said, um, I, I didn't come from a content background. My background was primarily in, in operations and technical and customer support, integrations. So I, I love when there's like chaos and I can organize it and build a better process. So I kind of liken my journey to doing jigsaw puzzles because that's what you do with jigsaws. You got all of these pieces and you got to organize them. You need to put them in order to make a gorgeous picture that you can hang on your wall. So I came to the team at the time, it was called the, the Customer Technical Communications Team. And this team creates technical documentation for MasterCard's customers. They help them to understand MasterCard rules, how to configure their systems, and basically how to be a partner um, and to do business with MasterCard. So um, I come to the team and, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm leading a customer technical team, uh, technical documentation team. How, how is this going to work? And um, so I start meeting with people, and I was one of those people who thought documentation, yeah, you create a Word document and you send it out. And, and um, as we all know, that was completely wrong, just wrong. Um, I found out that it was quite um, a lot more complicated than that. People were talking to me and data and structured content and taxonomy and content strategy. And all of these words were completely unfamiliar with me. So it's like I had this puzzle, had all these pieces, and I needed to put it together. But I, I didn't know, I didn't have my little map or key on how this picture should look. Um, I didn't know how it's going to build this puzzle, but I knew I had to um, perform some discovery, understand the team, the tools, and more importantly, the value that this organization um, brings to MasterCard. So um, I began to examine all the puzzle pieces. And the biggest asset I know people talk about are people, right? If you don't have people to do the work, you don't bring the value. So we have to protect our people. And I had to understand, what does this team look like? And I found out I had over 60 team members across six countries. Um, and they encompass what we call our core MasterCard team, plus some um, acquired entities and dedicated product teams. So they're creating content for specific products. And I found out in just the United States, there was over 200 years experience in creating content. So each of these teams I found out created content, but some were quite unique in their processes. They weren't all aligned. They weren't all similar. Um, they each had different processes and procedures that they used. So now that I'm familiar with the team, I've started to look at our tools. And what I found out is fortunately, we had some fantastic tools at our disposal. First, we were using Zoom in as our delivery channel, which provided our customer base a really great experience. Um, it was a main delivery channel for MasterCard customers, and it was um, resided on our interface, our UI called MasterCard Connect. The application that we use, we named the Technical Resource Center. So this is where all of our customers came to get their technical communications from MasterCard. What I found out is Zoomin provided the engine to power the TRC. Um, and what I saw, what the value they brought is that the content could be an HTML or it could be in PDFs. And PDFs that the customer could curate they could um, group together documents that they wanted, download it, and create their own personal libraries, which was quite valuable to them. Um, it was flexible because it was device agnostic. You could go online. You could also log in from your mobile device. Um, and more importantly, I don't know if you ever have a group of papers and you need to do some research and you're looking for specific items, maybe like for MasterCard, it would be authorization. Can you imagine flipping through hundreds and hundreds of documents to find out where authorization lives and where all that content is? It, it would take forever, right? 
So um, this interface provide us a searchable um, way where they could look through all of the documentations that we have, thousands and thousands of documentation, and find the information that they need. And even better, it was personalized through entitlement. So when they logged on to the interface, they would get content that was um, of particular interest to them. And that's quite valuable. So they didn't have to look through everything. They could search through the things that um, was of most value and benefit to them. Um, and with all of that, we also were provided the ability to retrieve analytics on the site. So we could further customize the experience, figure out any issues that we had with our searchable content, how many people were looking at our content, was this content even valuable anymore? All of these things were very valuable as we're looking to um, evolve our content and evolve the customer experience. Awesome. So we're we're very glad, of course, that you inherited Zoomin, but we're even more happy that you're really happy about the fact that you inherited Zoomin. So um, really interesting stuff there. But what other tools did you inherit? Oh, that's a good question, and you're right. I was happy that we had Zoomin because it, I felt like we had a leg up, um, or at least I had a leg up. I had a little notch in my belt, so that was very important going into this experience, this journey. Um, but another uh, tool that we used was Ixiosoft. And Ixiosoft was our component content management system. Um, what I found out with Ixiosoft is that they already had a tight integration with ZoomIn, so that was quite valuable too. Um, when I joined the team, our team was just getting the training on Ixiosoft and we were about to launch it. So it was a really key time for me to join and to really grow into this process with the team. Um, what I found out, the benefits of Ixiosoft is that it allowed our team to publish their um, content themselves. That was a big win for us. Um, it was device agnostic like Zoom In, but the biggest benefit is that it allowed our authors to reuse objects for consistency. And it's all about the experience. When, when people see our content, it should be like MasterCard. And I don't want to sound too corny, but it should be priceless, right? So when you come into um, the Technical Resource Center and you're downloading our content, it should be a priceless experience and it should be consistent across. You know that this is MasterCard. It has our look and our feel. So the reusability, really was like those puzzle shapes. Um, when you have your puzzle and you have this piece and you said, oh, this fits here. Um, it's because it has the same shape. It can be used throughout. Um, so our authors could develop content once, deliver it, and it can be consumed in multiple locations. And it becomes virtually unlimited uh, in our output format. That's awesome. It sounds like you had First of all, amazing people uh, and a very large team from what I'm used to. And you had some powerful tools that work together seamlessly. So that's, that's all great. But I'm guessing that it wasn't all roses. So tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they wouldn't have asked me to, to leave the team if there weren't some, something to do there. So there's <laughs> always challenges. <laughs> They just don't tell you about them at the beginning. They let you figure right. it out. Right. <laughs> so um, going back to my puzzle, I'm looking at the pieces, and um, I'm seeing something's missing here. So if we have these great you know, people that are working with the team, talented uh, people with all these years of experience, we have the best-in-class industry tools, what, what could go wrong, right? Well, I found out that we recently um, had given our customer satisfaction scores, and when they came back, the scores were at 50%, which was a really low score for MasterCard. wasn't really happy about that, but as some people said, well, Jill, you can only go up from here. So that was a positive. But um, the other part of this is that our management team um, had a lot of newcomers like myself. Like I was new to content. 
a lot of um, our management team, my direct reports, my manager, we were all new to content. So we were coming in, you know, um, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed with all of these great ideas and um, trying to figure out how to implement them, right? Um, and then we had, like I said, I have this wonderful team that had been with the company um, 15, 20, 25 years. And they were used to the way things were. And even though some of our tools weren't um, optimal, they were what they've used forever. So we're human, right? We, we get stuck to the things that are familiar to us, and we take on the mantra, if it ain't broke, will I fix it? But we, right. we had to evolve. We had to evolve. We had to reimagine the customer experience. We had to utilize the tools that we had to, to make a better um, environment for our customers and a better environment for ourselves. And lastly, there's one that's, you know, all of corporate America, right, resources. So I come to this team, and, and a lot of my team members were telling me that they were overworked, um, they had too much work, um, they, they barely had time to do anything. Well, I found out that we didn't have a way to measure the capacity on our team. So that becomes a real problem um, in an operations environment to try to communicate to management and to finance that, hey, we're understaffed and underfunded. So I need to find a way. How do we measure um, the capacity and um, figure out a way to understand how our staff should be um, how our, our staff should be uh, right sized. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's a that's a lot of challenges. Um, so I I happen to know because I know your predecessor there that your Zoom in implementation was very very new, and as you mentioned, you were just bringing on Ixiosoft at the time. So you had all of these changes that had just happened or were ongoing. Plus, you had this voice of customer score that had historically been very low that you had to raise. Um, and to do all that with proper staffing and funding is just incredible. So how did you sort of unpack all of that? How did you think through it and line it all up so that you could start to make a difference? <laughs> Um, very carefully. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of conversations. I mean, it, it, it's a lot. So I'm learning what content development is, and I'm learning about these new tools, and I'm learning this new team. Um, so I had to figure out uh, the challenges and where the gaps were, Megan. Um, first, I had to determine what our goals were. That's important because you can't get where you want to go unless you know what that is. Um, I needed to figure out how should our team look. You know, like I said, where, where is the um, request coming from? What's driving it? Uh, I had to figure out what our content strategy is. I had to figure out what content strategy was, quite, frank, quite frankly, because it's the first time I heard about it. Um, I had to figure out how we could gain or if we could gain efficiencies through our tools and automation. But um, at the top of everything, I had to ensure that we honored our commitment to our customers to deliver that elevated customer experience. Um, our team resides under global customer care, so the customer experience is at the forefront of everything that we do, and that's where we start from, right? So I looked at all of this, and I'm figuring out all the pieces, and um, the starting point was to complete the implementation of Ixiosoft, like I said, we were right at the beginning, and to gain the, some efficiencies with the integration with Zoomin, our content delivery platform. And we needed to um, retire the other legacy tools that we were using so we could gain the value that we had in Ixiosoft and Zoomin. Nice. Before um, you go on, I have a, a quick question from the audience that I think is highly relevant here, so I just want to throw it in here. Um, they're wondering if you can share a little more about what those legacy tools were that your team was using, and then how you how you transitioned from that from those tools to Zoom and Ixiosoft. And some of that we may cover later, but can you share a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, so we were using oxygen and we were using basant. And um, these are fine tools. But we wanted to gain, like I said, an elevated experience. And, and the hard part is, like I said, we had a lot of our content um, with our legacy tools and our teams were very used to working with them. And um, we were using something through a Citrix environment, which um, wasn't as optimal as we wanted it to be. So we wanted to elevate it and, and really focus on the value that the ICSYSOM Zoom and integration would bring um, for us. And we'll talk about those values a little bit later. Um, but it was, we had to basically set deadlines. We trained our team on the new tools. We provided support. Um, and, and we're still like at the end of that migrating off. It's not a, hey, on November 22nd, you're going to um, not use these tools anymore. We had to build the processes and training and ensure that our internal teams had all of the resources that they need to make this transition as smooth as possible and ensure that we were still meeting the demand for our, our business partners and our internal, um, our external customers and internal business partners. Nice. Thanks for answering that. Feel free sure. to carry on where I cut you off. Okay. So as you see here, um, I had my puzzle pieces on the table, so now we have to build the puzzle, right? And the puzzle all starts with a foundation, like a house starts with the foundation, the puzzle has a foundation. And I don't know how you guys do puzzles, but I always do the outside, and I know how big it is, and, and the outside's where I start. Once I have that together, I can build upon it. Well, I found that our foundation, that outside of the puzzle, was our content strategy. Um, we had one content strategist who'd been with the team for less than a year, and the authoring team had not yet embraced um, the content strategy idea. They didn't quite understand it, um, and they weren't sure what the value that was going to bring them, and so I, I had to figure out how do I get everyone on board with this content strategy? How do I ensure that our foundation that we were using for our tools was was found was on firm and that we could build a, a sound platform on it. So um, what what I determined is that we had a lot of part time information architects on our team and they were formed from the different various groups that we had and they were supporting um, the teams that they worked on. But with the one content strategist and um, in meeting all of these things that had to be done, I realized that we needed to create a core information ar um, architecture team. So we went to my managers and I said, hey, we're going to have to give up a couple of resources so that we could build this full-time information architecture team. Um, and we strategized and we picked the two great people in our organization who were going to join this content strategist and, um, uh, and build our team. Their primary responsibility was in content creation. Um, uh, and where before when they were part-time IAs, their focus was all on authoring. If there was content to author, they drop their information architecture work and pick that up first. Now we had people who were devoted full time to creating the content strategy that we had and to focus on that foundation which we would build um, all of our future endeavors on. Um, they would be the integration point between our authors and our technology team and um, other taxonomists in the organization. And really, like I said, help create that um, seamless MasterCard experience and ensure that our technology team understood, understood all of the requirements that we needed to enhance the customer experience. So just to add a little scope here, so you went from information architecture being a distributed function across maybe other technical writers who were primarily a technical writer and just had a little IA experience to having two full-time IAs to cover? Is that right? Yes, two full-time IAs and a content strategist as well. 
So our awesome. our content strategist um, was very versed in in this field and um, served as a mentor, you know, for our uh, full time um, IAs that were coming on board. And so it's a great story to tell that we not only had a basis to build our content strategy on, but we used our internal resources who were excited about learning more about um, content strategy to help build this and, and define a new career path for them as well. Cool. So as we see on the screen here, um, now that I had my foundation, I had to get all the puzzle pieces together and group them. You know, you get your puzzles and you look at the colors and you say, you know what, this looks like it belongs over here. Well, I had to do that too. And I had to group all of our light colors. And one of the biggest groups is our customers. So um, I had to listen to our customers. I heard that they didn't like us, but I needed to know more about that in order to know what direction did I need to go into? So our global customer care had a customer experience team, and they performed outreach to our customers. You know, um, it was better that we stay kind of separate from that, Megan, because sometimes when you're really close to your baby, you can't see where your baby may have problems, yes. where somebody's coming from the outside could really have that very open, frank discussion with the customer. Yes, very true. Yes. Yeah. So they started a co-creation workshop, we called it, and um, they just started imagining what would that enhanced customer experience look like to them. Um, what we found out is that our customer wanted content that was easily digestible, um, that was actionable, and that was relevant. Um, sounds like an easy thing to do to me, but... <laughs> um, what we determined is that the content needed to be an asset, you know, to their daily operations. What they told us, which, you know, just broke my heart, they hired teams of people to consume our content, you know, where some of our competitors didn't require so much um, care and feeding. And, I, I, you know, I may need, you know, a lot of care and feeding in my personal life, but it shouldn't be that way in my work life. So we had to make some changes. Um, so you're so saying your customers – hired teams to consume the content you were developing. Yes, yeah. As much wow. as it pains okay. me to say that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's <laughs> Just not making what we sure want. I understood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hired teams of people to consume our content. No, never a good story. Um but what you see here is actual feedback from those um the workshop. Our our customer experience team went on the road and they went to our customers and they said, here's our content. Tell me what you like about this content. What works for you? What doesn't? So if you look at that, they, they took the content. Oh, let's go back again, um, Megan, to the previous slide. They took the content and they had red dots, yellow dots, and green dots. And they put red dots on the stuff that didn't work for them. They didn't like it, get rid of it. Yellow meant we were going in the right direction, but, you know, needed some more work. And then we had green, like, keep this, we like this. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of red dots on that screen. So we, we had to figure out how to fix that. Um, and how we started that, how we started to build on our promises, you know, as we're putting all these pieces together, um, we knew that we had to build on the experience, delivering a scalable, personalized um, product, um, and we had to deliver on our commitment to our customer, which was working with you to proactively deliver technical documentation that's timely, it's accessible, and it's relevant, like I said. So figuring out where the gaps were, um, enabling reuse, automation of content, um, utilizing effective dates so they knew when um, the content became actionable for them that um, they could know that right away and we would be able to update our documentation accordingly. Um, translation automation was important because localization is quite important in a global or um, economy with our customers being everywhere. Uh, we needed business analytics, which would drive um, intelligent choices for us. 
Um, we, of course, wanted to keep that self-created content, that personal experience. We wanted to introduce a SME review process um, where we could collaborate with our internal um, business partners so that we could reduce the number of uh, inaccuracies in our content. There's nothing more frustrating than when we have to re-publish uh, content because we made a mistake and the customer has to redo work on their side because we made some mistakes. Um, more importantly, we had to ensure that this was personalized, that customers could get the information when they needed it, how they needed it, and as you know, as uh, much or as frequently as they wanted. And it has to be scalable. So um, the goal became in reach when we did the integration with Zoom in and, and Ixiosoft. So with the Zoom in and Ixiosoft, and integration, we updated our content template, which was a big win for our customer. We had a format that they could um, use and, and really get to the meat of the information they needed very quickly. Um, in addition, it allowed our authors to self-publish. We were able to build a synonym and acronym depository, and all along while we're improving the search experience, which is a constant um, improvement cycle. Um, and it provided data specialization, which, which was part of our content strategy framework. That's really cool to hear how you lined all that stuff up. Now, we had talked previously, and you had mentioned that your, your sort of North Star was improving CSAT scores. That was your voice of the customer. Uh, in, initiative that you wanted. So can you tell us about some of the very specific initiatives or goals you took on specifically to drive that? Yes, of course. Um, the very specific, like I said, was changing the layout um, of our content. Uh, so to get to that five seconds or less, the customer said, when I get a piece of documentation, I need to know within five seconds or less do I need to even go any further? So if you look at what you have on the screen here, this is our before. Our before, we had the information scattered very vertically in the document. And if you have a 50-page document, you're scrolling forever to figure out, okay, what is this document trying to tell me? Um, we knew we had to change that because that's not a, an optimal customer experience. So next, We'll look at the after. We updated the content and we utilized um, very good format that put on the left rail of the content um, information that told us what was the audience, what's the effective date, what um, are the products that we're speaking about. So me as a customer, I could look at that left rail and determine very quickly if I'm an issuer and this documentation is about an acquirer, I know I don't have to be, um, I don't have to go any further. I can move on to the next document. We really focused on that above the fold experience for them so that the information that they needed to know was right in front of them. We created an, an executive overview so they could see what the, um, the context of the document was right away and help them to understand what actions that they needed to take, getting them closer to that five seconds or less. That's awesome. How Can you just give us an idea of how difficult or easy that was to change the, the look and feel of it in your Zoom in implementation? Oh, boy. we So it was, I'm not going to say it was easy because we had to imagine the format. We had to gather feedback. Um, from our customers. We had to talk with our tech team who had to talk with Zoom in and Nixiosoft, and there was a lot of collaboration involved and a lot of technology that went into creating this format. Um, but once we had it and once it was implemented, we got a big win from our customers. They were very happy with um, this format. It, it did give them the information they needed. And it was easy for our authors, too, because they knew once they filled in this information on the templates, they had all the information they needed to, um, to satisfy their customers. 
So as you look on um, the screen here, you can see the before and after. Before the integration um, that allowed this format, we had several steps that we had to do to publish documents, um, and it was quite time consuming. After the integration, as I stated before, uh, the authors were able to create the documentation in Ixiasoft, and they could publish directly to our Zoom in platform. This saved a lot of production time and allowed um, the technology team who had been our, our um, published our content before, they were able to save time and really focus on the things that would drive value from a technical aspect. So um, our picture's coming together, right? And we've, we've figured out all of the tools and all of the pieces and we're you know, putting them in the right places. Um, we've enabled productivity. We've even, um, increased and enhanced customer experience. Authors are using consistent reusable objects. We could develop once and deliver a lot of different places. Um, we had topic architecture, which included business data um, that we use for search facets to track our jobs and, like I said, to continue with that personalization objective. So we're looking at things that made our, our internal teams happy and things that made our customers happy. So it was a win-win all the way around. Um, so now we're on a great path. Um, our puzzle is all assembled, um, and we have to now frame it and looking at how do we want to frame it, how should it look in our space, um, what are some of the, the goals that, that we've set forth, um, and what the future looks like. So what success looks like to us is that our customers are happy, increasing that customer satisfaction score. Um, we become... Uh, a place where uh, content people want to work for us. We retain our employees. It's an exciting place to work because we do things the right way and we're focused on the customer. And we have these exciting, great tools to use and, and people want to know about that. They want to say, hey, I want to come work for MasterCard because they have all of these best-in-class industry tools and experiences. Um, we have ways to to measure the efficiencies that we've gained. Um, and we're building, more importantly, what all uh, businesses want. They want a return on investments, right? If it isn't um, providing value to them, then, then why do we have it? So we want to make sure that we continue to provide that enhanced experience for our customers and bringing that value in for MasterCard as well. Very nice. So uh, those are all really good things to shoot for. Do you have some specific examples of outcomes that you achieved? Uh, sure. So we've been talking about all of this time about customer satisfaction. I'm happy to report that this past year we increased customer satisfaction by 2%. Overall, since I started in um, this role, it's been 6%. So we're on a very fast track of bringing value to our customer. But more interesting the past year, remember how I said that our customers had to hire a team of people to do to, um, to uh, um, digest our content? Right. Well, the ease of doing business, we also measure that, and that increased by 6%. So customer satisfaction 2%, but it became a lot easier for our customers to do business with us, which is very important. And I'm sure that customer satisfaction will continue to, to go up as well. That's awesome. Very, very nice. So we're getting some questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Jill, for all of that great detail. Uh, I can go ahead and read some of these questions, and I think Scott may jump on and read some as well if he wants. Yeah. Um, while you're looking, at, you while you're looking at them, yeah, I wanted to ask Jill a question first while you look at the questions from the uh, chat room. So Jill, you Go mentioned that you had, you had to learn about content strategy. And as the um, editor, co-editor of a book called The Language of Content Strategy, we brought 52 experts together and, and asked them each to define one vocabulary word 
and explain why somebody who wanted to be a content strategist would need to understand that word. It was a very challenging project in itself just to get everybody to agree and to kind of um, talk about it in a single voice. Did you find any resources um, that were useful to you as on your exploration to understand what content strategy was that you could recommend for others? Um, I found, and, and I'll tell anyone this, that um, when you don't know something very well, you find people who do. So what what I had in, at my disposal is a very good content strategist and very patient and took time to explain to me what needed to be done. Um, sometimes I had to really, you know, help them tell me in very clear, simple language. And one of the people actually gave me a book called Information Development by Wiley. And it had yeah. a lot of um, a lot of content in there that kind of helped me to understand why it was important and what we needed to do as well. But um, I, by no means, am an expert. Uh, I really rely on smart people that know content strategy and know what to do, and you trust your instincts and um, trust their judgment to um, move forward. And, and it's working because our customers are telling us that this is the right way to go and our internal business partners are, are happy with the direction that we're going as well. Excellent. For the awesome. viewers that are uh, on the show today, I think the book you're referring to is Information Development, Managing Your Documentation Projects, Portfolio, and People, written by Joanne right. Hackos, formerly of the CIDM. So for those of you looking for that, you can Google that. Also, if you're looking for uh, the language of content strategy, you can go to the language of content strategy com, where there is a uh, free version of the book available online in a browser that will also help you with some of those terms. Um, I have another question, which is, you had the um, the great um, opportunity to reshape how your company has um, been able to interact with customers. How has that impacted the morale of your team? Do you feel like they feel like they're there's a reward in, in making this effort and it's worth it? Absolutely. So when I started, it was a shock to everyone that the customers weren't happy with our content. And this wasn't <laughs> a failure of our team. And and I had to let them know that because they're like, what do you mean? You come aboard and all of a sudden our customers are unhappy. But really, it wasn't anything that they were doing. It was how we were doing it. So one thing that I encouraged our team members, every single team meeting was to talk about empowerment. If they felt like we were going down a path that wasn't in the best interest of their customers, they were empowered to speak up. They were empowered to push back um, to our internal business partners and say, this isn't in the best interest of our customers and this is what we should do. For example, if we were going to communicate something that wasn't clear, that they could ask the questions, they could make it better, or if we weren't giving our customers enough time um, to digest the content that we would push back on publishing so we weren't in a rush to publish and we could get all of the information that they needed so that they would know how to react. And I just preach this all the time, empowerment, empowerment, empowerment. And through this process and by backing them up when escalations occurred, they really started to feel empowered. And I've seen a big change in our team where they're coming up with more suggestions and ways to make things easier because they see that the management team is receptive to those ideas. We love those ideas. And Again, I want to make MasterCard a place where people want to come and they want to work here. So I think we've seen an increase in uh, morale uh, with our teams, and, and I'm really happy about that. Yeah, that's, that's I love really that you nice brought up – sorry, go ahead. I'm just saying that's really nice to hear, and I'm glad that you shared that because I think sometimes technical documentation people feel um, – the last of the food chain, if you will, you know, they're uh, the, now now explain away our bad design is <laughs> sometimes our job, right. and and it's not always do as rewarding, especially if the writers know there are better ways to to do things, but um, oftentimes they don't know, like you su you suggested, your team didn't really know, and we're kind of surprised that the customers were unhappy. We did a show, uh, Megan and I, recently with somebody who was talking about information science and. Um, 
you know, sometimes people are surprised when scientists monitor consumers to see what they view and what they and how they read. And as it turns out, they don't actually read all the writing that we <laughs> we write, and they don't read it word for word in the linear way that we write it. And so that's often shocking too to writers. And so I'm glad that you were able to encourage them to see the value because I think making changes is complicated for humans and uh, having a good feeling about it and and also a business value, I think, makes it easier for people to, to want to explore and to do better work. It, absolutely. absolutely. And as they see that customer satisfaction score rise, it's a feeling of accomplishment, right? And you feel like I I have contributed to the bottom line of, of my company and what I do is important and here's why it's important. Um, one of the things that we did during the co-creation workshop and some of our conferences is we're bringing our writing team in on this conversation so they can hear from the customers themselves. And that validates the feelings that they have. Again, it adds to that empowerment. And um, when you feel good about what you do, um, you want to continue doing it and you want to do better. I'm going to bounce off of that idea of empowerment and sort of paraphrase a question that came in from the audience. When managing a team, I know very, very well that you kind of have to find this balance between empowering the team to make their own decisions with the idea of governing uh, the standards across your content set. And so somebody's actually asking about that balance and how you how you how do you collaborate with your global content writers and more importantly how do you find that balance between allowing them to do what they do best without allowing them to go rogue and make unilateral decisions that might not fit with the standards that you're creating well um it, it's all about guardrails right so these are our guardrails and you establish those um, we have our standards, we have our style guides, we have our tone, et cetera. Within these guardrails, this is how we're creating our content. And then we start to look at ways to improve what we do. Um, we look at, you know, are we publishing the right content at the right time? And we give them with that empowerment to come to us with ideas on how to change it. So you have that freedom, but then you also have guardrails that they follow as well. Nice. Yes, those guardrails are so important. Beautiful. Um, somebody asked what the time frame was from beginning the analysis to the end of to the completion, and I think I don't think they meant this entire 18 month period because we kind of did that up front. I, I'm guessing that this came in about the time where we were talking about the analysis of the legacy tools and then making the shift over to Zoom and, and Ixiasoft and creating that integration? So that's an interesting question, but um, I inherited this. So I came in after they would already made those decisions and made that shift. Um, but I've been with the team for, um, like I said, almost two years. It'll be two years at the um, end of this year. And so it's a continuous process. And right now we've um, made some major wins this year with the integrations. It took several months to work through our goals and to get them implemented. But I, I want to be careful and say we're never going to have an end goal because we're always looking for ways to optimize the experience, looking for ways to improve looking at adding additional value. So I don't see this as, you know, an end point. It's just we're moving the goal along further down the road. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. I, I think, think that's so. A Again, I don't – yeah. Uh, so a couple sort of related questions. One person wants to know how you made reuse easier for your writers, and then somebody else actually is asking about this idea of content strategy and reuse across – various departments and whether that sharing of content was just for your tech writers or, for example, did someone in marketing, were, did marketing start thinking about content reuse in the same way that your tech writer might or some other department? Well, uh, MasterCard is actually really um, focused on delivering an enhanced customer experience. So we're putting that at, the, at a corporate level 
um, a goal. So we did recently what we call a customer experience week. And I create technical documentation, but to your point, Megan, we have marketing people that create documentation, people who create our website, et cetera. There's all these different places where we communicate to our customer. And we've made it intentional to collaborate together to build ways to create the seamless experience for our customers. We're collaborating with teams that we never did before to find out what are the things that we have in common and what are the ways that we can drive value together and going after these wins in a more collaborative format. But I really loved how they've embraced it and we've had, um, instead of having what we call customer support week, it's been customer experience week and we had all kinds of conversations around the customer experience and and um, we're tracking initiatives on a uh, uh, company-wide uh, format on how we're really driving value and ensuring that we're moving closer to that enhanced experience. That's awesome. I think there's a, a future show on how you do a customer experience week. Sounds like yes. something fun, Scott. <laughs> we got to do that. <laughs> I think that's Can we do that virtually? I think that we can pull that off. <laughs> exactly. Do it. Awesome. Amazing. Very good. What do you think about your next Jill, steps? Is... is what I'm curious about, Jill. Like oh, go ahead. You, you, you've got this under wraps now. You, you're, you're learning lessons. Your team is starting to think in creative ways about how they can use your new tools and systems to do better work. Um, what do you think comes next? Are there are there aspirational things you have that you want to do with your content um, in the future that um, you might be able to share? Um, sure. So. We're continuing on with our content strategy. Um, one of the things that's been very exciting for us this year is we're, trans uh, we're transferring, migrating content from legacy applications onto the TRC. So our customers are, are even asking even now, when's that going to be complete? Because they know when we get this content on our Zoom Empowered um, Technical Resource Center, it becomes searchable and they get all of those values of self-creating content, et cetera. So we're really looking forward to that in the short term. In the long term, I'm looking forward to having more artificial intelligence built in, machine learning, creating um, more concise executive summaries, enabling chat bots. Um, I'm hoping next year that we start looking at building a great ontology uh, model for our content as well that will link content together. Um, I'm looking forward to really thinking about how we use infographics. It's a big thing for me because whenever you open up these new technology now, they don't have step-by-step -step instructions. They have pictures. So I, right. I want to figure out how do we translate our content into something similar where we're using more infographics to power it. It's a universal language, um, doesn't require a lot of localization, um, but how do we incorporate that strategy into what we do? I've got a question That's from awesome. somebody on Twitter we wanna... who wanted to know, if, sorry, I have a question from somebody on Twitter that I think it's easy to answer, which are you incorporating video documentation into your strategy? Absolutely. That, that's part of that infographics videos. Um, people are all about that. I realized a shift in, you know, like normal news. You know, you went from newspaper to a lot, now a lot of articles are videos, right? So, yeah. excuse me, we want to do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> that makes cool. perfect sense. Megan, do you have a final question right. for Jill? No, I just wanted to thank Jill. Um, thank you so much for your time. This was really, really interesting. Loved hearing about it. And, you know, I've just always been very impressed by how you how you run your team. And so very good job and keep it up. Thank you very much. I really loved it. And, and um, you can find me on LinkedIn if you have any other questions. Excellent. I'm sure Wonderful. you might get a follow-up. There are definitely people who yes. have questions, and we can have you back at another time to talk about the future and some of the other topics that I know you only got to, to brush on just briefly. So thank you for joining us today, Jill. I really appreciate it.
All right, so Jill, Jill is at MasterCard, and you can reach her on our LinkedIn profile. Check in the attachments and links section for uh, some content there and how you can reach both Jill and Megan and Zoom in software. Uh, so thank you, MasterCard, for uh, sharing your story today with us. We really appreciate it. Today's show has been brought to you by Zoom in Software. Zoom in is a company that transforms technical product content into a dynamic and intuitive customer experience so people can find the answers they need to use your product or service to the fullest. Zoom in has a cloud-based solution that allows you to streamline content operations and gain powerful analytics so you can refine your content strategy and improve customer experience. If you want to do uh, that, I'm sure you do, uh, check out the ZoomIn website, zoominsoftware.com, and also look in the attachment section for some content provided by ZoomIn uh, that you can download or click on a link and view right now today. And I want to tell you about some upcoming shows. First of all, tomorrow we'll be June, joined by Forrester Serious Decisions Analyst Kathleen Pierce on our biweekly coffee and content show to talk about the rise of content atomization to support artificial intelligence and advanced personalization of content. Be sure to join me and Patrick Bozek tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific time uh, for that show. It'll also be recorded. Uh, and speaking of recordings, Tuesday, November the 10th, uh, Megan and I will once again, join you, and this time we'll have our guest, Paul Parada, the Technical Communication Wrangler, who's going to discuss the Content Wrangler's annual survey, Technical Documentation Industry Survey results, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, them and take questions from the audience. So we hope you'll join us for that show as well. And the following week, we're going to have a rescheduled uh, uh, show that had been scheduled earlier, but due to technical difficulties, we were unable to show you at the time. And this show is about content strategy. It's going to be a little bit about the history, what's going on today, and the look at the future from our content strategy evangelist, uh, Rahel Ann Bailey, that Tuesday, November the 17th on the Content Wrangler channel. And you've been watching the Content Wrangler webinar series with Scott Abel and Megan Gilhooley as your co-host today. Uh, thank you to Jill Sheffield from MasterCard for joining us. I'm Scott Abel, uh, the Content Wrangler. Don't forget to give Jill a rating on the way out the door using the Rate This tab. One through five stars. Five is a great rating. Uh, one is low. And there's a little field to share some feedback with Jill if you'd like, and we'd appreciate it if you if you did that. Today's show has been uh, recorded. You've been watching how MasterCard turned its documentation into a superior customer experience. You can rewatch this program at any time. Just wait about a half an hour and return to the same URL you're using to watch the live show, and you'll be able to access a recording of the show that you can share with others, and we hope that you do. Until next time, be safe, be well, keep doing good work. We'll see you on another uh, episode of the Content Wrangler webinar series. Thanks for joining us today. Goodbye.